In this chapter, we're going to talk about labor quality and the investment in human capital. This extends our discussion of the labor supply side of the market to consider not just the amount of labor that is in the marketplace, but the quality and therefore productivity of that unit of labor. Quality of labor can be thought of in four broad ways. There's formal education, such as secondary school and college. There's on-the-job training, the kind of training you get when you begin working in a particular field, and that typically comes from the business itself. Experience, simply doing a job for a long period increases our uh, productivity and the quality of labor. And then physical and mental health. Workers that are healthy and in good condition are likely to be more productive than those that are not. All four of these things come together for most people, but certainly we can enhance the productivity and thus the quality of labor by working on any one of these components. Human capital is something we associate with the quality of labor. And for our purposes, it's really going to be uh, formal education and on-the-job training. We're going to think about human capital investing. You invest in human capital when you go to college. The firm invests in your human capital when they give you on-the-job training. Investing increases the productivity of resources towards a future return. You probably have thought of investing in the financial markets. And that's a good proxy for what we're doing here. If you invest in, say, the stock market, what are you really doing? You're giving up something today, the money to buy the stock, in order to get a future return on that, likely dividends or appreciation of that stock long term. But we can think of the same thing when we talk about human capital. You invest in your college education, your firm invests in training you because they want to get a future return. They're giving up something today. You're giving up something today to get a stream of future returns from that investment. So human capital investing is just an extension of the kind of investing we see in physical capital and financial assets. We know that higher education positively correlates with income. You can see that over here. This is data that shows annual earnings for different age groups based on educational attainment. You'll note that those that have less than 12 years, which would be a high school diploma, have lower earnings at every age compared to those that have a high school diploma. And those that have a high school diploma have lower earnings than those that have a college degree, 16 years of education, or a graduate degree, 17 plus years of education. It's also worth noting that as we increase in age, no matter what our educational attainment level, we generally do see an upward trend in our earnings, at least up to some point and that point is typically around retirement age, when we would expect our earnings uh, to drop. This illustrates that not only does formal education and on-the-job training increase our earnings, but that age and experience also increase our earnings. Profit profiles are steeper for those with more education. Note that the ability across the age span for someone with less than a high school diploma or a high school diploma, these trajectories are less steep than those with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. And that makes sense because, as we're going to see, people that have education may be presented with greater opportunities to move up within an organization. They may be perceived as more versatile in a company so they can take on a broader array of different jobs. Whatever the reason, it's clear that the benefits of getting a formal education are not just the higher earnings at any age group, but the greater increase in earnings that come 
with age. We're going to build a human capital model and focus initially on the decision to go to college. And then later on, we'll augment that model by looking at the firm's decision to provide on-the-job training. The human capital model is going to be a similar model to what you would learn in a finance class for investing in stocks or bonds or other financial assets. But we're going to use it to understand an individual's decision to go to college. Take a look at this diagram here. Notice we have an age profile from 18 years old on the horizontal axis all the way up to 65. And then on the vertical axis, we have annual earnings. The first curve I want you to build is the HH curve. This is going to be the high school earnings curve. This is someone that goes to high school but doesn't go to college. Notice what happens. At 18 years of age, they choose to stay with their diploma, their high school diploma. They don't continue their education. And they start earning money right away. They're out there working, and with experience and on-the-job training, they're growing their earnings. It eventually peaks uh, in their older years and then drops as they approach or go into retirement. So this is the earnings profile of a person that does not attend college. Contrast this with a person that does attend college. At age 18, they're not working. So their annual earnings are below zero. Now that may sound odd, but remember, if you're going to college, not only are you likely not working, but you're paying for the college, you're paying the tuition, you're paying for the books and all other costs that are specifically occurring because you're attending college. I say specifically because eating is a cost that occurs when you go to college, but eating would occur even if you didn't go to college. So we wouldn't consider that a cost of college, but we certainly would consider books and tuition to be that. These are called direct costs and accrue over the four years that you attend college. So for the college profile, we have a negative in terms of annual earnings for the years 18, 19, 20, and 21. Essentially, age 18 to 22, this person is upside down with direct costs. But then, they come out of college, they graduate at 22, and their earnings are now higher than they would have been had they not gone to college. Had they not gone to college, they would be at an earnings here. But now they go went to college, so they start out a little bit higher. And then as they gain experience and on-the-job training, they grow their earnings profile until they retire at age 65. So we have two separate profiles here, the high school earnings pro high school graduate earnings profile and the college graduate earnings profile. It's important to understand that the college student is making an investment and in giving up something today in order to get a return higher earnings in the future and that's reflected in two areas so from 18 to 22 this person that goes to college does have the direct costs we got that that's this area here tuition and books but they also have what are called indirect costs and these are the foregone earnings that they would have had had they went directly into the labor force. The cost of going to college, the opportunity cost of going to college, are really the direct plus the indirect. You are not only paying the tuition and the books and other related expenses, but you are foregoing the earnings that you could be making if you were working. That means the total opportunity cost of college are far greater than the monetary direct costs. Therefore, if we add one and two together, we get the total costs, also known as total opportunity costs. Now, why would we do that? Because there is this increase in earnings 
that comes over your working lifespan from age 22 to 65 that would not be available if you didn't go to college. So this is the cost, one and two in this diagram. This is the benefit, the incremental earnings. It's important to note that the incremental earnings are those earnings that you would get each year, each working year, above what you would have gotten if you didn't go to college. So for example, if at age 40, this person hadn't went to college, they might be making 50,000 a year. But because they went to college, they're making 75,000 a year. The incremental earnings are therefore 25,000. Yeah. The benefit of college, the payoff in college is not the $75,000. It's the additional money that you get above and beyond what you would have earned had you not gone to college. And that's area three here. Okay. So we give up one and two to go to college. That's our investment. And then we get a return, a yield, whatever you want to call it, of incremental earnings. Now, this is a crude kind of rendering, but it gets us thinking about the process of investing in college. We can refine this analysis a bit more using some mathematical techniques. And one of the most important is going to be what's called net present value, NPV method. These techniques are, as I mentioned, the same techniques you would learn in a finance class and how to evaluate uh, the pros and cons of stock investment or bond investments. Net present value method converts the value of future dollars into present dollars. We take future value and turn it into present value to determine whether an investment is efficient or not. The method is pretty straightforward. The first thing we need to do is determine what's called the discount rate. The discount rate is the return on an alternative investment. For our purposes, it's easier to think about it as how much interest you would have to pay to borrow money. Most people borrow money to go to college, uh, and so we can think of the cost of those funds as the interest that you would pay to get those funds. And that's abbreviated R, the discount rate. The second thing we do is we apply this formula here for each future payment. For example, if you are going to receive $100 right now, right now, just imagine that, $100. To find the present value of that, you would plug in $100 into the numerator, and then in the denominator, you would take one plus the discount rate Let's assume it's 10% just for simplicity. So you have 1.1 to the nth power. N is the year in which you're receiving that payment. Since you're getting it right away, N becomes zero. Well, 1.1 to the zero is one. So that means that $100 given to you today is worth $100. But what if you get that $100 a year from now? Well, the future value is $100. We divide it by 1.1, but to the first power. And that means that it's worth $90.91 today. So $100 that you're going to receive one year from now, assuming the interest rate in the economy is 10%, is worth $90.91 today. And then you just continue on. If you're going to receive $100 two years from now, that is worth $82.64 today. One alternative way to think about this that may be more intuitive is consider changing this formula and solving for the future value. In other words, if you were to have $90.91 today, you could take that and put it in the bank and get 10% on it and have $100 a year from now, which means 100 a year from now, assuming the interest rate is 10%, is worth $90.91 a day. Let's do it one more time. If you have $82.64 today and you put that in the bank at 10% for two years, you will have $100 two years from now. So $100 two years from now is worth $82.64 today. 